I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is a story of a very special time and a very special love affair between a bright and artless ten-year-old and a bitter, soured man who made himself old before his time. But however it ends, it begins with hate. What was that, Arthur? Uh, a, a rock through the window. That's an ugly mob outside. Yeah, no goods and adequates ingrates. Because you've taken their livelihood away from them. My livelihood as well. I can't go on losing money with the mill. Since Robert walked out on me, I don't need any more. But Thomasville does. Good Lord, it's the only real industry we have left to keep the town alive. Are you my lawyer or theirs? You know whose lawyer I am. My friend or theirs? That's a question which gets more and more difficult to answer. Jasper, it's Christmas. And Robert had good ideas for the mill. I don't want to hear any more about the mill or about Robert, my son, or my daughter. Most of all, I don't want to hear about Christmas. That cheap, tawdry, pagan celebration. There, at last. The riot squad. They'll break up that no-good rabble. That's my Christmas present for them. Finally, the police have dispersed them. Cowards all. A mob has no courage. Well, what are you going to do about the window? Close the room off. Heaven knows there are enough other rooms for me to wander through alone since I've been deserted by my family. Well, that's scarcely fair to Emily. Emily? Did I once really have a wife? Was there some warmth in this house? While my sister lived. Well, she's dead. Too many years ago for me to want to count. There's no one left but my housekeeper and me. At least Mrs. Murchison hasn't deserted me, as you want to. Go then, Arthur, go. It's safe now. The papers are all signed. Well, I won't execute these till after the holiday. The day after Christmas. The day after Christmas is Sunday, so I can't do anything until Monday. Very well, but the execution is signed, sealed, and delivered. When I sell the mill, I'll be not a millionaire, but a multi-millionaire. Or do you mean that crowd of hicks the police just chased away? You think I'm frightened of them? Oh, I didn't mean physically. 
And I didn't mean concerned either. I mean terrified for your immortal soul. Oh, don't trouble. I'll let myself out. Oh, this is much different. If I don't see you again before the great day, Merry Christmas. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Daly. Who was on the phone, Mrs. Murchison? Oh, such good news for you, sir. It's little Mary herself. What did she want? Sure, she's still on the phone waiting to tell you herself. I have no wish to talk to my daughter. Ah, but when you hear her news... What uh, news? Well, uh, um, she, she wanted to tell you herself. If she's leaving that damn foreigner and coming home alone, I'll talk to her. Otherwise, go and hang up. Without listening to what she has to say? There's only one thing I want to hear from her. An apology. Oh, you're not going to talk to Miss Mary? No. I wanted to save the news for her to give you. Oh, but now, sure, I have to say it myself. It's a baby she's going to have. She wanted you to know you're going to be a grandfather. No, oh, some penniless foreigner. No, thank you. You can tell Mrs. Blumenthal it won't work. She's still as completely cut out of my will as her brother. When you hang up the phone, you can bring me a cup of tea. I'll be in the library. Oh, the good Lord favor me and put the words in my mouth. Uh, uh, Mary, sweetheart, forgive me for being gone this long. Well, that's all right, Merch, honey. Is Dad there? Well, uh, Mother, and to tell you the truth, he's after having a little bit of a light on, and, um... Well, it's all right. I know what he's lying down on. Any reconciliation with me. I thought maybe the time of year and the baby... Did you tell him about the baby? Well, I I didn't want to. I, I wanted it to be your surprise, but... Uh... Okay. Forget it. I get the whole picture. Maybe I knew before I tried again. Now I know it's hopeless. Merry Christmas to you, Merch, love, anyway. And a happy new year. Oh, Mary, my darling. Oh, what's the use? How long can you fight? If he just wasn't so stubborn. If only Mr. Crown could forget himself and accept someone else into his heart. Come in. It's your tea, Mr. Crown. No, thanks. Just put it on the table. Yes, sir. Well, was there something else? Yes, Mr. Crown. This next Christmas would be my 25th that I've served your family. Oh, in heaven's name, spare me the Christmas spirit. It's choking me. Well, it's choking some of the rest of us, too, Mr. Crown. Everyone has a limit. You're not alone in that. I've just been talking to Mary, and I've lived through a long, difficult time in your family. I'm given my notice. Before dinner? I honestly don't care if you ever eat again. Or live. I just have time to catch the next bus. I'll send someone else to clear out everything that's left of mine in this house. I want no part of it or you ever again. A little while later, the front doorbell rang. With Mrs. Murchison gone, Jasper was tempted not to answer it. But when it rang again... Some secret urgency drew him down the long corridor. On the walk, he winced. His elbow pained him, and the arthritis in his right leg jumped and sent shivers. Every ache and pain he had ever known seemed to assail him till the magic moment he opened the door and saw, standing on the stoop, her freckles burning bright in her snow-white face, her pigtails stiff in the icy wind, Jennifer. And even though he didn't realize it, magic was upon him. Yes? Who are you? Jennifer Swallow. What are you doing on my doorstep? If you please, Mr. Crown, I'm freezing to death. Well, you came here of your own free will. What do you want? I have a business proposition to put to you. Not interested. How do you know if you haven't heard it yet? Don't be rude. You're talking to your elders. Excuse me. I didn't mean to be rude. I'm just anxious. Anxious about what? My proposition. 
what I want to talk to you about. All right. What is it? I'm too cold to tell you here. My father says that no gentleman keeps a lady waiting. You're no lady. You're just a child. And you're no gentleman. You're a... A what? You're a kind man who's going to offer me shelter. <laughs> Very well, before we both freeze to death. Come in, come in. Thank you. You shouldn't have let me in, you know. But you was. Get in. My father says you should never let a salesman get his foot in the door. Are you a salesman? Oh, no. It's just an expression, you see. In a manner of speaking, so to speak. What is it you want, young woman, young lady? My name's Jennifer. Jennifer? I'm not interested in names. All I want to know is what your business is here. Shouldn't we go into the parlor? No. You're kind of old. I thought you might want to sit down. Well, uh, maybe I'd better. It would be much cozier. Very well, then. Follow me. Even though it is quite cold, it's... Very nice weather for this time of year. What? I'm just making conversation. My father said... I don't believe it. Believe what? I don't believe your father ever gets a word in edgewise with you around. All right. It's warm in here in the library. There's a fire. You can sit over there on the other side of the fireplace. Thank you. So many books. Ah. A lot of knowledge in the world if you young folks would take time to pick up some of it. Now, Miss, uh, Miss Jennifer, just what is it you want? Well, it's at the church, you see. Nobody is working this year on account of you closed the factory down. You blame me for that? Oh, no. I mean, that's your business, of course. But it meant somebody had to do something special. About Christmas, I mean. I might have known it. <laughs> Sending a child here to blink her innocent eyes at me. Who put you up to this? Who sent you here to ask for money? No one. I just want to... Don't lie. For a moment, you almost fooled me, young lady. But I might have known there was something behind this. There is, isn't there? Well... What is it? Present for the church? Oh, no. I already won those. For win the booty. You... You what? I said I already got those. From Win the Booty. You know. No, I don't know. What is Win the Booty? It's on television. Don't you watch it? I don't have a television set. Oh, it's fun. The man asks you questions, you see. And then you have to answer them. And that's what you did? Of course. Why are you so surprised? I'm just amazed that you didn't ask him most of the questions. So you won some prizes, eh? Oh, Scrumptious ones. So you see, we don't need you for that. You don't say. But what do you need me for? Well, see, the presents are to be handed out tomorrow night at Christmas Eve. And we have no Santa Claus to do it. I wanted you for that. Of course. Because I'm rich and you thought that I might bring some extra presents. That wasn't it at all. Somebody else had an idea you should come here and ask me? No, sir. This was my own idea. Really? Just what's the matter with the guy who knows all the answers? Who? Your all-wise father. Oh, he isn't here this year. What's keeping him so busy? A first-class son of a gun. A, a, a what? His superior officer. My father's in the Navy. Both of them are. Who? My father and the first-class son of a gun. That isn't exactly what he called him, but I promise not to repeat the other. <clears throat> I see. Well, if it can't be your... F I mean, a Santa Claus. Oh, <laughs> too skinny and too serious. He never understands a joke. He's really an old stick. But what on earth would make you think of me, child? You don't just want me to be Santa Claus. You have an ulterior motive. What's an ulterior motive? It, you... You want me to do something else, don't you? Oh, that. Of course. You admit it. Oh, sure. 
we don't have a budget for the Santa Claus suit. So I thought if you'd be him, you could afford to rent it. Where are you going? I'm opening the door for you to leave, Jezebel. My name isn't Jezebel. That's a matter of opinion. Just keep heading for the front door. Then you won't leave Santa Claus? I'm afraid I'm not the type. You could be just perfect if you let yourself go. I wish I could believe that. Oh, couldn't you? Only one way I could. Well, how's that? You get me the Santa Claus suit, and if you still want me, I'll be your Santa Claus. Honest to Pete? Honest to Pete. Well, I'll try, but it's going to take a miracle if I do. You know, I wouldn't put it past you. Jasper Crown remained with his hand on the door. One part of him congratulating himself for having resisted that elfin charm. The child was just trying to use him and his wealth, as people always were. Egged on by her elders, no doubt. But another part of him, lonely and forgotten, and rusty with disuse, cried out for her return. For a miracle. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Never underestimate the power of Jennifer. That night, Jennifer broke open her piggy bank and counted her capital. Two dollars and twenty-three cents. The following morning, she bought a return trip ticket on the bus to Dawson City, which cut into her budget to the tune of one dollar and sixty-two cents. Once she got there, she set her jaw and started to comb the city. It was well after lunch when suddenly the freckles were dancing across her nose and her pigtails vibrating with delight. For there, just as she told herself there had to be, was a sign saying, Santa Claus suits for rent, dirt cheap. The proprietor was a wonderful man with a jolly round face and bristling white eyebrows and a shock of snowy white hair. As Jenny said afterwards, she almost wished he might be persuaded to come and play Santa Claus. Hmm, but that's really a silly idea. He lives too far away. I beg your pardon, miss. Did I say something? Well, there are only two of us here, and I I didn't say anything, so I think it must have been you. There I go again, thinking out loud. You couldn't, could you? Or didn't I think that part out loud? Uh, what part? About wanting you to come and be Santa Claus in Thomasville at our church tomorrow evening. Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't. Some other people are expecting me. Uh, but I can rent you a suit, you know, a, a Santa Claus suit. Do you do you see one that you like? Well, there are so many. What's this one made of? Ah, red velvet with ermine trim. <laughs> you you like it? It is nice. How much would it cost to rent it? Well, now, that's a, a very handsome suit and quite cheap at the normal rental of a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Too much? Oh, much too much. Well, now, uh, uh, how much were you thinking of? Sixty-one cents. Sixty... Oh, <laughs> sixty-one cents, eh? Now, now, isn't that a coincidence? As a matter of fact, right down beneath the counter here, I may have just the thing. Ah, oh, yes, sir. Here we are. Now, let's see. Boots, belt, hat, pants, and uh, tunic. And, of course, the whiskers to go with it. And the price happens to be just right. On the nose, as the saying goes. Sixty-one cents. It is pretty old and tattered. Yes, it is. Seen a lot of use. I have to admit it isn't in the best of repair. But it's the genuine thing. Well, it is pretty ratty. But I'll take it. After all, the price is right. And the kids who are going to see it won't notice the condition. Because to tell you the truth, 
These days, our clothes are pretty ratty, too. Well, righty oh, I'll, I'll wrap it all up. And while I'm getting it ready, you can uh, uh, sign your name right here. What's that for? Well, I'd like to get this suit back. You you might be surprised, but sometimes I have a, a little trouble. <laughs> this way, if you shouldn't return it, any time I want to claim it, I'll have proof that it's mine. <laughs> Why doesn't Mrs. Murchison answer that bell? Oh, of course I forgot. She's gone. Well, rotten tarnation. I have to answer it myself, I suppose. I'm coming, damn it. I'm coming. Well, you don't have to pull it out of its socket. It's It's so cold. I'm freezing. Oh, it's you again, is it? Well, what is it this time? Look, I got it. I got it. Got what? The Santa Claus suit. I thought you'd be happy. Why should I be happy? Because you said. You promised. You're not going to Welsh out. Aren't you even going to invite me in? So you tricked me into a promise I should never have given. I didn't either trick you. Oh, no? Well, we'll see. Well, what are you standing out there for, child? Want us both to freeze to death in this drafty hall? Go on to the living room. I've had the window fixed. Yes, sir, Mr. Crown. Well, in you go. There's a fire here, and it's warmer. It certainly is that. Thank you. So you got the suit, huh? Yes, sir. How? That's my business. Uh, didn't take you long to maneuver it once you found out I wouldn't fork out for it, huh? I... That's right, Mr. Crown. Well, sit down. Thank you. That all? Excuse me? I mean, can't catch your tongue, huh? You certainly had enough to say yesterday. Why so silent now? I'm disappointed. Why? Because you're not happy, too. About the suit, I mean. Why should I be? I don't know, Mr. Crown. But I was just sure, sure you would be. Well, you're wrong. I'm not. I made a bargain, and I'll stick to it. You don't have to. If you don't. I won't hold you to it. I mean, an unhappy Santa Claus wouldn't be much good. Do you want to? Want to what? Be unhappy? No, to get out of it. I don't even know if I can get into it yet. Close your mouth. You look silly with it open. Oh, come on. The suit, I mean. The suit. Come on, let's see it. I can't open it. Mean, it is very difficult, not. Oh, give me that stupid parcel. Stop fiddling. Can't spend all night on this. Oh! Good Lord, and what ragtag did you find this flea-bitten outfit, huh? Huh? I didn't either find it. I rented it. Rented it? And just what did you pay for this threadbare collection of junk? It cost 61 cents. How much? More, when you count my bus fare from here to Dawson City. A dollar sixty-two plus 61 cents. Two dollars and twenty-three cents. My whole capital. And just where did you get two dollars and twenty-three cents? It was my tree money for Christmas. But I'd rather have a Santa Claus than a tree. So I broke my piggy bank and I hate you. <laughs> oh, stop it. Oh, stop it. All right, I'll be your Santa Claus. Oh, I'll even try the suit on now if you like. Well, if you still want me, that is. I'll be a pretty gruff Santa Claus, but... Oh, shall I try the damn thing on? Yes, please. After all, I spent the money. And something is better than nothing, isn't it? Honesty, Jasper. The startling white honesty of a child. It's what you've been looking for, grasping for. Something to believe in again. And yet, too late. Too late. You're so conscious of the age in your body, the bile in your gut, your loneliness, that rheumatic elbow, that gnawing peptic ulcer, the tight place around your heart, or is what you fear most, your mean and tiny soul. And while 
while Jasper thought these private thoughts, he was slowly putting on the Santa Claus suit, shaking his head at each tattered garment and worn accessory that went with it. But as he put each piece on, watching through Jenny's eyes, each separate piece seemed to shine suddenly as luxuriously rich and sumptuous as the velvet and ermine suit she had first seen. And the whiskers were pure white and thick and curly. And the boots were like the most expensive Moroccan leather. But the biggest miracle of all was in Jasper. Gone was the constriction from the heart. The nagging ache was no longer dragging at his stomach. The rheumatic arm was loose as a whip. And a magic sponge had wiped the lines from his face and the meanness from his heart. Like a glove. You look so different. I feel so different. Do I look like Santa Claus? Not look. You are. You are Santa. It's just perfect. Only... Only what? Do you think you could, you know, just a little, even, smile? Not only could I smile, I even think I could laugh again. Oh, Try, Mr. Crown, try. You could call me Jasper, Jennifer. And you can call me Jenny, Jasper. Hello, Jenny Jasper. (laughs) 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 Oh, Jasper, this is going to be a good Christmas. (laughs) Oh, Jenny, this is going to be the best Christmas ever. Now, do you think? Yes. I was just coming to tell you, my dear child, that my husband said we are just about to commence. Mr. Crown's all dressed and ready. The Reverend isn't teed off, is he? Teed off? I mean, his feathers aren't ruffled. The Reverend is a saint, my dear. A perfect saint. Why on earth should he be angry? Well, Grandmother said he always played Santa Claus. And if someone else wanted to be it, he'd be mad as a wet hen. And I said, why is a wet hen mad? And she said, because its feathers get ruffled. Your grandmother, I should say your family in general, Jenny, doesn't quite understand a man of God. The minister, my beloved George, is only too happy to welcome back a sinner and a backslider like Mr. Crown. He would sacrifice any of his little pleasures for that. Oh, uh, which reminds me. Yes, ma'am? For some reason or other, Mr. Crown says he has to see you before he comes in. Oh, dear, I hope nothing's gone wrong. Because if Jasper's feathers are ruffled, this whole party could lay an egg. I thought we'd never get rid of that old stork. I told you he was an old stick. (laughs) In the mud. (laughs) Now, what I needed you for was to know if I look all right. Come over to the chair. Here's the wig all wrong, and the hat not, not down over your nose, not sort of jaunty to one side. And he didn't put the rouge on your cheeks like this. Oh, and now you really look like something. Oh, Jasper, you look just beautiful. And so do you, Jenny. Oh, I don't matter. You're the star of this show. Now you go out there and twinkle. <laughs> Watch my stardust. Just call me Jasper, Jenny, and everything's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just call me Jenny Jasper, and I know it's going to be. <laughs> Here he comes, everybody, all the way from North Pole. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs> been witness to the regeneration of Jasper Crown. A child's drive and belief has brought him back to the precious gift of present youth and laughter. But is it a true conversion or only a momentary aberration? Is the magic of this moment in the Christmas legend in the suit and in Jenny? 
What happens if he loses either? Or both? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The church party was an exceptionally long one that year. And before it was over, Jasper Crown had indeed become Santa's alter ego. Many other gifts beyond those Jenny collected on Win the Booty were distributed. All of them from Jasper's generous purse. $50,000 to the church itself. Another $50,000 to the community chest. And many smaller but not less welcome gifts. Then, with the party over, Jasper, after a long last hug with Jenny before she went home, returned to his own house. But however cold the empty old mansion might seem, Jasper, in his suit of red, was warm and glowing inside. And his first trip was to the telephone. Christmas greetings, hello. Happy Christmas, my darling daughter. Yes, Mary. You're a miserable, old, wretched, stupid fan. Oh, I can't believe it. I I mean, you don't... Well, well, you never were stupid. And you certainly don't sound miserable, old, or wretched. <laughs> well, none of those. But I was stupid. How can I make up for it to you and... and Leon? Make up? Oh, Daddy. I wish you could be with us for Christmas. It's a little late for that, but... I have another idea. I want to buy plane tickets for you and Leon to come visit me and ring in the new year with me. Oh, Daddy. A real good new year. Oh. I just called Robert, and he and his wife are coming home with the children. Oh. He's going to start up the mill again for me. It could be a real family reunion. Oh, Daddy, I, I don't know what to say. Oh, say yes. Please, just say yes. <laughs> of course it's yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Daddy, what happened? You said... Well, not only like yourself again, but like... But I don't know. Like the spirit of Christmas. Past and present. And future. You'll see, I hope, when you come home. <laughs> Mrs. Murchison. Come in, come in. His angels be with me. I thought, Mr. Crown, for a moment you were the real article. Uh, I can't claim that. I wish I could. Oh. But I feel as cheerful as him. What brings you here Christmas morning? Well, now, sir, I felt real bad. Particularly this time of year and I'll walk an out on you. And here is Christmas Day and you even without a dinner. So I was asked to bring in a little basket here if you'd accept it. I accept it from the heart. And with my thanks. But I'd like to to ask you something in return. What is that? Will you come back to work for me, Merch? I need you. Oh, oh you called me Merch. Mary's name. She's coming home with her husband and her child-to-be for New Year's. And Robert and his family. Oh. They're moving back to open up the mill. I'll need you, Merch. Ah, oh, the blessed Mary preserve it, so you will. I'm glad I'll be to come home. Good. But what is it that's come over you, Mr. Crown? A child brought me this suit, Merch. And putting it on, I went back to the man I was. I don't want to question either because I believe them both to be a miracle. And I thank God to have found happiness and peace again. Ah. And pray to him it will not be taken away from me. Every silver lining has a cloud. Every sky a rift. The worm nestles even in the heart of a rose. Jasper could not buy his happiness this fast, if ever, again. As she has been his angel, Jenny now becomes his nemesis. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Jasper. I didn't expect... Me to answer the door? Well, I saw you coming up the walk. I didn't mean that. I meant I didn't expect to see... I hate to say it, but I've come for the Santa Claus suit. No. What do you want it for? You'll have to 
take it off now, Jasper. Why? Because I signed the paper. I only rented it, and I'm responsible. I have to take it back. Funny to see you out of the Santa Claus suit again, Jasper. Oh, Jenny, I feel... I feel naked. It's the way I told you. But that's silly. You aren't the way you were at all. You're nice now. The way I always knew you were underneath. As long as I have the suit? As long as you have you. That's what counts. My father says, Oh, wait a minute. Tell the chauffeur. Here's the street. Oh, I was sure it was this one. Try the next. You watch one side, and I'll watch the other. You're not watching, Jenny. That's because I've already looked all the way down. It must be the next one. Why are you looking so sad again, Jasper? Because I feel that way. Not even sad. Frightened, Jenny. Why? I like the way I am. I didn't like the way I was. And I'm afraid that if I let go of the suit, I'll go back to being what I was. Never. Anyway, when we get to the shop, you can always buy it. Oh, tell the chauffeur to turn here. To the right. Take the next right, Edward. You sure this is it? Yes, I know. Because there's the hat factory and the cigar store and the man who cooks spaghetti in the window of his shop. And right there next to it... What? What, Jenny? Sir Edward, stop and back up. See, Jasper, it's a dead-end street anyway. And there's that big school and the storage company and then the Chinese laundry. And right here between it and the man who cooks spaghetti in the window is... was... Stop the car, Edwards. But, Jenny, there's nothing here but an empty lot. But there can't be. Because otherwise, then it would have to be a miracle. Yes. That's what it would have to be. But that's impossible. Why? Because miracles have to be about holy things. And they have to be very old. Well, what's holier than Christmas? And it's pretty old. I... I must have made a mistake. We'll just have to keep... Little Jenny, listen to me. This is a funny thing to ask. But I ask it with all my heart. Don't let's go looking anymore. Because we just might find him. And that's the thing I'm most afraid of. Why? Because then I'd have to give the suit back. And I might stop believing again. Oh, is that the time? The right time? Yes, what's wrong? I've got to get back to Grandma's fast. I'm catching a plane today. Edwards, home, step on it. A plane? Where to? Pacific. Japan. Back to my father. He's so lonely. I'm all he has. But Grandmother was getting old. And we were both going to spend Christmas with her. Only that first class son of a... I almost said it. Anyway, the Admiral said he couldn't spare my father because of the general situation. Oh, what am I going to do? About your father? No, about the suit. Jenny, why don't you let me handle this? I'm here, and your father and you are going to be on the other side of the world. How could you handle it? Well, let me tell you, and we'll write it down as soon as we get home. Now, here's the advertisement, Jenny. I'll read it. If the owner of the Santa Claus suit rented to Jennifer Swallow will present his copy of the receipt to me, Jasper Crown, my address, phone number, and so on, he will be remunerated to whatever degree he deems fair and equitable, up to but not to exceed the sum of $1 million. This ad will appear daily till the first of the new year and for the month of December of each succeeding year until the decease of the aforementioned Jasper Crown. Okay? But Jasper, a million dollars for that cruddy old suit? I told you, it's worth that to me. Do you have to go, Jenny? You shouldn't have to ask. You know how fathers feel about daughters. Now I do. Your own daughter is coming back to be with you. And your son, too. You'll never miss me. 
Oh, I will that. Don't ever mistake it. But I'm finally realizing all this fuss about a suit I thought was a key that unlocked my heart. When it wasn't the suit at all, it was you. I, I, I hate goodbyes. They're always sad. Why can't they be laughing goodbyes? Couldn't you laugh? Just a little? You said that to me once before, remember? And you laughed. I don't think anything could make me laugh now. I bet I could. Try it, Mr. Crown. Try what? That's not what you're supposed to say. What am I supposed to say? You're supposed to say, you can call me... Jasper, Jenny. And you can call me Jenny, Jasper. Hello, Jenny Jasper. <laughs> Hello, Jasper, Jenny. <laughs> oh, Jasper, it's been such a good Christmas. <laughs> the best. The best ever. <laughs> as she had to. And Jasper placed the ad in the paper. For ten years, it appeared every December as Jasper lived out a full and happy life. His family, grandchildren, and his mill workers filling every Christmas for him. Until early this December, when he died, peacefully and quietly in his sleep, grateful and joyful, to go join his beloved wife. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Crow. I've been proud of you these last ten years. I've... I've felt at peace with myself. The suit is in that rosewood box on my bureau. And here's a blank check signed Fill in what you want. Oh, no. This is paid in full. I'm more than at my rental. <laughs> but I will take the suit back because it is Christmas again. And who knows? It may be very useful to someone else, eh? <laughs> now, excuse me. It's a busy season <laughs> for me. <laughs> now, that good. Now, done, sir. Now, friends, sir, and victim. Did you feel like that? I did. It's been most of it. Such a good life. And the best of it you made. But I'm tired, Jenny. So tired. Say good night to me. Howard Da Silva, Jennifer Marlowe, Virginia Payne, E.V. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I'm 
Marshall. This is a very special occasion for me. I'm to be a little more than your host. This time, I will not only be introducing the story, but telling it to you, acting it out. The Mystery Theater's special Christmas story this year, Charles Dickens' the immortal classic, A Christmas Carol, with Guess Who as Scrooge. Bah, humbug. Our mystery drama, A Christmas Carol, was adapted from the Charles Dickens classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Ian Martin. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol begins like this. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt about that, whatever. The register of his burial was signed by the woman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Screw signed it. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Ebenezer Scrooge? Oh, he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Solitary as an oyster. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it out one degree, even at Christmas. Christmas, Uncle God save you. Uh, what, 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 oh, what? Oh, it's you, nephew. What brings you here on a miserable, cold, windy night like tonight? Ah, cold and windy, yes, and the snow falling softly. A perfect Christmas Eve to say, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Ah, humbug. Christmas, a humbug? Oh, you don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry or the world at large? What reason have you yourself to be merry? You're poor enough. Oh, come then. <laughs> what reason have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Don't you taunt me, Fred. Bah! Don't indulge yourself in expectations. Humbug. Take me as I am, Uncle, and as the season is, and don't be cross. Where else can I be when I live in a world of fools? Christmas. Fooey. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? Time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own plum pudding and buried with a stake of holly to his heart. Oh, come along, Uncle. Can you not let down for once and enjoy yourself? <laughs> come along, nephew. Keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mind. Yes, but you don't keep it. Leave me alone, Nan. Much good it may do you. Much good has it ever done you. Oh, there are a lot of things, Uncle, from which I've never profited. Christmas among the rest. Except that when it comes around, who could resist it? A kind of forgiving time of year when men and women seem by one consent to open up their hearts freely. So then I say, Uncle, though it never put a scrap of silver or gold in my pocket, I believe it has and will do me good, and so I say, God bless it. Who's that? What's all that there? there? I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. It's, it's just that it is a holiday, and, and my hands were so cold. Yes, let me hear another word from you, Bob Cratchit, and you keep your Christmas by losing your employment. Oh. Please, sir, I, I humbly beg your pardon. It was just a, an action on the spur of the moment. Just apply the spur to goad you into finishing your work, Cratchit. And let's hear no more from you. Yes, sir. Well, nephew, why are you here? To ask you to dine with us tomorrow. Dine with you? Never. There's nothing more ridiculous than all the fuss and expense over Christmas dinner. Oh, Uncle, I want and ask nothing from you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. And with all my heart, I'm sorry to find you so resolute. But least, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. And be sure to make the front door fast. No wasting of heat here. No extra logs on the fire. Yes, Uncle. 
Mr. Cratchit. Yes, sir. May I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year? The first I am sure of, and I and I thank you. The other... Ah, uh... Who knows what the future holds? Be a good hope. The nerve of all of them. My nephew, of Westrow, and Bob Cratchit on 15 shillings a week with a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas. <laughs> enough to make a man retire to Bedlam. They're all mad, mad. Begging your pardon, Mr. Scrooge, a gentleman to see you. Yes, 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 yes. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the honor of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead for seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Ah, sad. Sad indeed. Still, I have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. Liberality? At this festive season, it is more than usually desirable that we all make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. You may make your pledge here. Are there no prisoners? We speak of the needy. Uh, the Union workhouses are not still in operation. They are. I wish I could say they were not. A few of us private citizens are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. Uh, what shall I put you down for, Mr. Scrooge? Nothing. Of course, you wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. By tax, I hope to support the establishments we have mentioned. They cost enough and more. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there. And many would rather die. <laughs> they would rather die than let them do so and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir, whatever your name is. I find you hard to believe, Mr. Scrooge. Cratchit, let him out. Close the door, Cratchit. To extinguish what cold remains? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, no, sir. Oh, come here. Uh, coming, Mr. Scrooge. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I wish to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'd be bound. Well, sir, I... And mean... yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. I, I would not presume to have an opinion... But then, it is only one day a year. Yeah, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Uh, I suppose I have no choice. You must have the whole day. Just make sure you are here earlier the following morning. I dine my usual melancholy dinner in the usual melancholy tower. Afterwards, climb the stairs to my living quarters in the gloom. Something about my door knocker stopped me as I was about to put key in lock. For one strange moment, it looked like Marley. Ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. To say that I was not startled would not be strictly true. And even after I was entered and locked in and my candle lit, I did pause irresolutely before I dismissed it with humbug, <laughs> humbug. Still, I was uneasy. Trimming my candle, I walked through all my rooms to make sure all was well. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as it should be. Small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready. A little saucepan of gruel, since I had a cold. What's that? The front door. The side door. The bell by my bed. The one on the mantel and, and, and on the sideboard. What do they herald? Who rings them? The cellar door. And that noise. What? Oh, I won't believe it. Yeah, I think it's humbug still. Grim Spectre, what do you want with me? Must. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Well, who were you then? In life. I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Uh, you don't believe in me? I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. 
You may be a bit of undigested beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy about you than the grave, wherever you are. <laughs> humbug, I tell you, humbug. Ah! Ah! Unbeliever! So, I unwrap the bandages from about my head to reveal the rotting flesh, the jaw fallen slightly to my breast, the muscles eaten long since by worms. Oh. Now... Do you believe me for who and what I am? Yes, oh, mercy, dread apparition. Why do you trouble me? I must. Why are you fettered and bound in chains? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link. I girded it on of my own free will. Is its pattern so strange to you? Or would you learn the weight and length of the coil you wear yourself? It was full and as heavy and as long as mine these seven Christmas Eves ago. And you have labored on it since. <laughs> My once partner in life, what a ponderous chain you have built to drag you down in. Death. No, no, Jacob. Oh, Jacob Marley, speak some comfort to me. I have none to give. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house in life. So, in death, weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead and traveling all the time? No rest. No peace, the incessant torture of remorse. I am here tonight, Ebenezer, to warn you that you have yet a hope of escaping my fate. Oh, you were always a good friend, Sankey. You will be haunted by three spirits. That is the hope you mentioned? It is. Uh, I, I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you have no hope but to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. But couldn't I take them all at once and have it over? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate on your mantel clock. And for your own sake, remember what has passed between us. Passed between us. Jacob, uh, do not leave me yet. And she was gone as if he had never been. And yet, he had been. And Ebenezer Scrooge would never be the same man again. He fell asleep without undressing upon the instant. A sleep that was destined to be disturbed, as I shall relate when I return with Act Two. When Scrooge awoke, it was dark, and the chimes of a neighborhood church were striking the four quarters. To his amazement, they were followed by twelve strokes of the bell. Twelve? Impossible. It was two when he went to bed. Uh, oh, why, it isn't possible. I could have slept through a whole day and far into another night. As I lay, I suddenly remembered that Marley had said a ghost would visit me at one. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? Your past. Don't you recognize me? A strange figure. Almost like a child. The outlines dimly seen. It wore a tunic of purest white and a branch of fresh green holly in its hand in a singular contradiction to the dress which was trimmed with summer flowers. 
But strangest of all, above its crown sprang a bright, clear jet of light which illuminated the darkest corner but obscured the face. And under its arm, a cap which looked for all the world like a candle snuffer. For some reason, I wanted it to put on its cap. Uh, the light is blinding. Would you not put on your cap? Would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I shed? Is it not enough that you are the one who fashioned me this cap and forced me to wear it low upon my brow? I? What business brings you here? Your welfare. Well, if you would regard my welfare, you would leave my sleep unbroken. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. Rise and walk with me. I cannot resist your command. But I am an old man, lightly clad and <coughs> nursing a cold to boot. Do not deny me. Come. Follow me. All of a sudden, I was flying, floating on air. The night had vanished as the city below me, and I was looking down on the country in the clear, cold light of day, with snow dusting the ground. Good heavens! I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling. What is that upon your cheek? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. The, the wind makes my eyes water. Lead me where you will. Do you not remember the way? Remember it. I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it so many years. Let us set our feet on the road. I will not tell you most of where we wandered as time stood still or raced ahead at a whim. The school where I was a child. The house I grew up in, an orphan. A terrible rush of tears remembering another outcast, a foreigner. An alien who in our mutual loneliness had once befriended me. Poor Ali Baba. I... I... It's too late now. What is too late? Uh, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. What might have been. Let us see another Christmas. What's that? Your aunt, who brought you up, passed away. Oh, oh no. Oh, a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. Amen to that. I will not gainsay it, spirit. When she died, she had, I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. We traveled further. Scenes flashing by like slides in a magic lantern. Old Fezziwig in his Welsh wig, my first employer... His Christmas parties with a groaning table and everyone dancing with a light foot and heart to the festive music. His kind wife and the joy of working at a desk one wasn't nailed to. And then someone I had shut away so long ago. What is it, Scrooge? That girl. Whom you shall sit beside. No. Oh, yes. This shadow most of all. Don't you remember me? I told you the light blinds me. Then remember me as I was before you put my light out. No tears, I beg you. None. If the idol who has replaced me can cheer and comfort you, I must not grieve. What idol? A golden one. Nothing but gain engrosses you. So, if I have grown wiser... I am not changed toward you. Our marriage contract was made when we were both poor. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Whatever you were, I freely offer you your release. Have I ever sought it? In words? Never. How, then? In a changed nature. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. And so I release you. With a full heart for the love of what once you were. May you be happy in the life you've chosen. Now I recognize you, spirits, and why you've come back to haunt me. Torture me no more. 
some shadows still to see. No, I, I can bear it no longer. Haunt me no longer. The light you shine is too bright for my eyes to bear. Give me your cap so I may extinguish it and you. In a puff of smoke, the figure was gone. And I had barely time to reel to my bed, exhausted from the long night's travels, where I fell into a heavy sleep. What's that? Oh, oh. Oh, the clock ticking away. Awake in the night of time. Almost one, when the second messenger Marley sends me from the grave will arrive. What ghastly shape might he take? What hideous form? What torture might this one plan for me? At least, I am prepared for anything. Well, prepared for anything, but... But nothing. Hello there, spirit. Are you invisible to me? <laughs> What's that? That great light from beneath my sitting room door. Oh, here's a fearful waste of light. A shocking extravagance. I must go in and douse these candles. Yet I, I'm afraid to enter. Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. Stop skulking there behind your bedroom door. Enter, man. Enter. Why, here's a prodigal spending of light in a great roaring blaze hot enough to set the chimney flue on fire. <laughs> Look well on me. Have you never seen the like of me before? Never. It is time your eyes were opened to this and other things. Spirit, I will be no trouble. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion... And I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Hold fast to my robe. In the blink of an eye, we were transported to a mean and shabby little house. Threadbare, but clean as a new washed shirt. And redolent of the mouth-watering smell of goose basking in sage and onion. And aromas of an eating house and pastry cooks next together, which came from the Christmas pudding. Whatever has got your precious father, then, and your brother, Tiny Tim? I never remember him, Martha, as late as this on Christmas Day. What a place is this? A house of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. See, here he comes now. The child he carries on his shoulder with a little crutch in his hand and his lower limbs bound in an iron cage. The youngest of the Cratchits, tiny Tim. Why, look at him struggle after the others as his father sets him down. Where are they off to? To watch one of the merriest sights of this merriest of seasons. The golden goose turn on the spit. Shh, listen. How late you are, my dear. And how cold. Oh, oh, come. Come, sit you down by the fire and have a warm. Lord bless you. After I've had a look at that goose, too. First, tell me, how did Tiny Tim behave through the service? Oh, as good as gold and better. Oh. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much mm. and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. I know. What was it this time? He told me coming home, he hoped everyone in the church saw him. Because he was a cripple. Oh. Because it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Oh, oh. oh. oh I feel so much for you. No, 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 no. You must not, my dear. Remember the day. Come, let's join the others. Tell me, spirit, will tiny Tim live? I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a little crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Oh, no, kind spirit. Spare him. That from you, recall your own words. If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh, 
I am ashamed. And should be, man, if you be man at heart, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surface is and where it is. Listen. A toast before we eat to Mr. Scrooge. To me? I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. Oh, I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. And I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. Oh, my dear. The children. Christmas Day. Well, I'll bring to his health for your sake and the days. Not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, he'll be very merry and very happy, I've no doubt. And now, a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, us, everyone. My very name cast a pall upon their happiness. But march you on the wealth of spirit among them which thought kindly on a man with as little spirit as yours. In particular, that poor little lad, Tiny Tim. Did you notice how generous he was to end the toast with God bless us, everyone, including even me. What a valiant little soul, in spite of all his handicaps. Perhaps your eyes are opening at last. But come, you have more to learn. Where now? Your nephew's house. <laughs> he said, he said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, that my uncle-in-law should speak so. Well, he's a comical old fellow, and not so pleasant as he might be. Oh, yes. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. And I will have no downturned mouths at this season. So here's a glass of mulled wine to our hands. Let's drink to the old man. Well, he has given us plenty of merriment at that. So... To Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it, nevertheless. To Uncle Scrooge. To Uncle Scrooge. No, 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 wait, wait. Let, let me go to them. May explain. Too late for me. The hour grows too late. Away. Where stand we now? This open place. A crossroads where I must leave you. Oh, forgive me what I ask, but I see something strange protruding from the skirt of your robe. That might be a claw for all the flesh there is upon it. Yes. Then see what you must see. From the sanctuary came forth a boy and a girl. Yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish but prostrate, too, in their humility. I started back appalled. Spirit, are these yours? They are man's. The boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware of them both and all of their degree, but most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow I see written doom, unless the writing can be erased. My time is sounding. Wait. Have these pitiful creatures no refuge or resource? I answer in your own words. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Oh, for one moment, help me. Where should I turn? Turn and face your future. The black phantom that approaches you now. Face. Your future. Your future. As the last stroke of the bell struck twelve, Scrooge turned to face a dread figure, a solemn phantom, draped and hooded in blacks and deep grays, coming, creeping like the mist about it towards him. I'll return with Act Three. Very well. The last phantom silently, slowly, gravely approached. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, 
which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand, which served as its only voice, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You answer not, but point where we are to go. Lead on, spirit, and I will follow. A great black cloud gathered me and carried me willy-nilly to the streets. Its shroud, like the figure that stood by me, hung about me as I listened to two gentlemen talking in the street. So, Mr. Grimes, old Scratch has got his own at last. I have been so informed, Mr. Goodfellow. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What on earth could he have caught? I thought he'd never die. God knows. Why should I care? What has he done with his money? Heaven knows. Not left to charity, and certainly not to me. Left to his company, perhaps. God knows he appears not to have had any sort of personal tie. By which token, it's like to be a very cheap funeral. <laughs> For upon my life, I cannot think of anybody to go to it. How dismal and awful to dismiss another human being in such terms. Forgive me, dread ghost. I did not mean to diverge. You wish to reveal something to me? You have my full attention. Fred, the news is bad. Bad? We are quite ruined. Oh, no, there's hope for us yet. If he relents. If he forgives or forgave, there might have been. Oh, but it is too late for the miracle. Poor old miserable boy. He's past relenting. He's dead. No! Wait, spirit, wait! I'm not ready to leave. What else would you have me look on? Tell me again about today. About little Tim on the grave. It, it, it would have done you good to see how green a place it is. Oh. But you'll see it often. I promised him I would walk there every other Sunday. My last born. My poor little broken child. Oh, please. I shall break down with you. Oh, my darling. We can all try to be brave. But how can we hide our sorrow? What is more final and dreadful than death? I want to help, Spectre. But something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. Tell me, what man was it I saw lying dead? Very well. You point. Where to this time? A churchyard. And here we are. The headstone. You would have me read it? Uh, tell me. Are these the shadows of things that will be or may be only? Oh, my own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been from all this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For once, you make no motion. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Good spirit, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. The three spirits shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on the stone. Give me your hand, I beg you. Give me your hand. I hold you to me. You cannot disappear. You cannot disappear. You... Oh, 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 bless my soul. What I cling to is my own bedpost. And wait, wait. Perhaps my time is my own to make amends in. Yes, I will live in the past, in the present, and the future. 
The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, oh, Jacob, on my knees. I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather, and I am as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. I'm as giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everyone. A happy new year to all the world. Hello there. Oh, hello. Oh, oh, there's the saucepan the ghoul was in. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's true. It all happened. Oh, 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 oh my God. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I'm a baby. I don't know what month it is. Throw open the window and rejoin the world. Hey, Mr. Grimes, what's today? Why, uh, 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 Christmas Day. Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do what they like. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Uh, hello. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Do you still run the poultry shop in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did on my way to open up. Oh, pray then, Mr. Grimes. Do I dare hope you have not yet sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big prize turkey. <laughs> the one as big as an ostrich? Oh, a delightful man. A pleasure to talk to him. Yes, Mr. Grimes. It is hanging there now. Yeah. What are we waiting for? I want to buy it. Bring it here that I may give directions where to take it. Send back your boy and I'll give him a shilling. Have him bring it back in less than five minutes and I'll give him half a crown. Better still, here's a five-pound note. Send him to deliver the turkey to Mr. Cratchit by cab at the address I give you. And what's left shall be your Christmas present and his. Shaving was not an easy task, for my hand was shaking, and shaving demands attention. At last it was finished, and I dressed myself in all my best and issued forth to the streets. The first person I met was a portly gentleman who had walked into my counting house the day before, saying, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. I hastened to intercept him. My dear sir, how do you do? I beg your pardon. I hope you succeeded yesterday. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge, that is my name. I fear not pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to allow me to contribute? May I have your ear, sir? Hmm? What? Lord bless me. So much. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you really serious? If you please. Not a farthing less. Will you do me that favor? Oh, my dear sir, I don't know what to say. To well, such don't say anything. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will indeed. Thank you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I. By all that's holy, is it you, Uncle? Me, Fred. You did ask me to dinner. Am I too late to take up the invitation? <laughs> too late? Uh, will you let me in? Will I let you in? Why, here's the merriest turn a Christmas can take, darling. Wife, here's Uncle Scrooge to share our Christmas. Isn't that a present for this day? You couldn't have brought Fred a better one. Welcome to our home, Uncle. For only the first of many times, I hope. It's a whole new year. Yes, and you may spend it all with us, if you will. Only today, for I must be in the office as early as can be. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't steal glances at each other. It isn't business on my mind, but recompense. <laughs> and since at last I have learned to laugh, <laughs> I want to have my first joke with the man I have perhaps wronged most all of these years. My faithful Bob Cratchit. A wonderful day. An evening with my nephew. A deep sleep that might have lasted for days, except that I was bound and determined to be earlier than my clerk at the counting house that Monday morning. I was as pleased as a child when I beat him there. Even more pleased to find that for once, 
he was late. When the door opened and he came in, he was a full 18 and one half minutes behind his time. His hat and scarf were off before he opened the door. In terror of the man I had been, he was on his stool in a jiffy, writing his pen as if he were trying to overtake the lost minutes. Uh, morning, Mr. Scrooge. Morning. A little late for that. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? I, I am very sorry, sir. I am behind time. <laughs> you are, yes, yes. I think you are. Now, step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand by this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, I feel myself forced to raise your salary. Huh? Why, why Mr. Scrooge, sir, do you feel all right? A I, I, merry I... Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas than I have given you for many a year. Not only raise your salary, but discuss your affairs and endeavor to help your struggling family over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. So, make up the fires till they hot us right out of the county house before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. It's not only a new year, but a whole new world for both of us. As we all know, Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. And he made a good new will for his nephew and his future partner, Bob Cratchit. One thing after a long life, he took to his grave, that he knew how to keep Christmas well. May it be truly said of all of us, and as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. What more is there to say after Dickens' Christmas Carol, except the eternal message it brings? A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Ian Martin, Evie Juster, Robert Dryden, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Hey, listen. Hear that? Singing. Of course, it's a carol concert. That's where everyone must be. Oh, come on, let's see if we can find them. Huh. Oh, I give up. I don't know where that music's coming from. We've covered so many streets and nothing. Yeah, no one. Oh, hey, honey, you're shivering. No, I'm, I'm scared. Well, there's a hotel across the street. But let's go there and use the phone. There's got to be one there. This is a ghost. Town. Well, there's no use wandering about anymore. It's a ghost town in the middle of Ohio. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Greetings of the season. I hope you like the tree. I put up a bit of holly, too. And mistletoe, of course, right there over the door. There are so many things to enjoy at this time of year. The warm, friendly spirit, that's most important. The time to be with family and friends. 
There'll be a lot of holiday traffic, too, as people make the rounds of visits or travelers are making their way back home. On a lonely road in Ohio, two such travelers are about to have the most harrowing experience of their lives. Snow is getting heavier, Skip. I wish you'd slow down. I hope we make it before dark. Oh, I sure don't want to get stranded in this, Joan. Oh, 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 oh no. Skip, what's the matter? We're skidding. I can't control her. Skip, do something. We're sliding into that boat. I'm doing all I can. mystery drama, A Holiday Visit, was written especially for Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juren and stars Lloyd Batista and Diana Kirkwood. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What are your plans for the Christmas holidays? Entertain friends or relatives? Going home to visit parents, perhaps? This is always get-together time. A time when people go home. Home to the families they've left behind as they've made their own way in the world. Joan Bartram made her way from a small town in Ohio to New York, where she worked for a while as a secretary, and then married Skip Bartram, an oil company executive. She hadn't been back to her home in Ohio in 12 years, so it was a particular thrill for Joan when Skip came home one night and said, How'd you like to go home for the holidays? <gasps> See your folks. Oh, oh Skip, I- I'd love it. But can we afford it? Well, the company's sending me to Toledo for a new training program right after the holidays, so the trip is on now. Oh. We'll just leave a little early and be with your folks for Christmas. Oh, what a surprise. I'm going to call Mother this minute. You don't want to just drop in on them and make it a surprise? And have them fade away? No, no. I want to give them something to look forward to. Oh, well, maybe you're right. It's been 12 years since I've been home. And you've never... Hello? Hello, Mother? Oh, Joan! How are you? Just fine, dear. Mother? Mother, are you sitting down? No. Why? Listen, Mother, get Dad over to the phone. I want him to hear my news. Henry, come here. Joan, are you pregnant? Oh, no, Mother. All right, dear. Your father's listening. I'm coming home for Christmas. Coming home? Yes. Yes, Skip has to be in Toledo after the holidays, so we're leaving early. In time to be with you for Christmas. That's the best news I've had all day. Joan, I... Your mother's doing her thing. She's... She's starting to cry. Yes, so am I. I have to hang up now. I'll let you know when we'll arrive. Okay, darling. We'll be waiting. When can we leave? Well, I'd like to get away by Saturday. We'll have to drive. I'll need the car in Toledo... Let's see, we ought to get to Runyonville by, well, the 23rd. The map uh, shows the end of the interstate. What do we do when we turn off? Um, Let's see. Uh, We go north on 84, it looks like. Yes, yes, north on 84 to Hamilton, then 42A to Blue Mountain... And we keep on that to Runyonville. Oh, I don't know. It looks as though the interstate keeps on going. Well, look there. Yeah. Uh, according to the map, though, there's a proposed extension. Well, it's been finished since the map came out, I guess. What if we stayed on this? Oh, we'd go straight to Runyonville. It looks as though we'd save about, um, about 20 miles, too. <laughs> so we're in luck. We'll stay on it. It looks as though, well... We may be at your folks a lot sooner than we thought. Oh, it's it's starting to snow. Oh, we're going to have a white Christmas. Well, I hope it doesn't get too thick before we hit your folks' place. Skip, how far have we come on this highway? Oh, about 40 miles. Have, Have you noticed anything strange? 
strange. Well, uh, you're thinking the same thing I am. Hmm. There hasn't been a sign or a turn off since we got on this road. Yeah, I noticed that. And come to think of it, I I don't remember seeing any cars passing us in either direction. Doesn't seem natural. <laughs> well, if this road's going anywhere, they're keeping it a secret. Uh, I'm getting a little uneasy. Maybe we ought to turn back and take Route 84 like we planned. Oh, I hate to do that after we've come this far. Now, this road's got to come out someplace. I see we've got about an hour before dark. And the snow is getting heavier. I, I wish you'd slow down. I hope we make it before dark. I don't want to get stranded in this. Oh, 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 oh Skip, Skip, what's the matter? We're skidding. I can't control it. Oh, yeah, Skip, do something. Oh, we're, we're sliding. I'm doing it? all I can. <laughs> Put any more tinsel on the tree, Harriet, and it's going to topple over. <laughs> I don't see how you can sit there so relaxed. Why are you so nervous? The children said they'd be here sometime today or tomorrow. They should have been here by now. Only because you think they should be. If anything was wrong, they'd call. You know that. Oh, you're right. I'm just so excited about having our Joan home for Christmas. I'm... <laughs> I can't relax. Well, I think I'll take a stroll in the snow. Need anything from downtown? No, dear. I've had everything in for days. I just wish they'd get here. They will, Harriet. They will. Now, you stop worrying. Worrying isn't going to get them here any sooner. <laughs> Joan. Joan, are you all right? Well, what happened? Okay, can you straighten up? Oh, my leg's caught. Oh, here, here, let me see. Uh, try, try twisting it a little bit this way. Oh, oh. oh there. Oh. There, it's free. Oh. How do you feel, huh? Dizzy. Oh, we crashed into the boulders. Oh, can we, uh, will the car move? Oh, pray. Oh, if I can back her off. Yep, I better, I better get out and take a look. Uh, um, oh, that does it. What's the matter? Uh, two flat tires. Oh, no. And only one spare, naturally. Oh, dear Lord, what are we going to do? We're miles from anywhere. Well, uh, at least the snow's letting up a bit. <laughs> oh, we can't just sit here on this... This ghost road. Oh, well, where will we walk? Hey, Skip, look. A light. Oh, yeah. Oh, about half a mile away, I'd say. It must be a town. Hey, do you think you can make it on that leg? Oh, yes, yes. I'd hop on one foot to get out of here. Well, we can phone your folks. Tell them we'll be a little delayed. We can probably get the car towed in. Well, it looks like we'll have to stay till morning. Well, maybe Dad can come pick us up. We can't be far from Runyonville. We can pick up the car tomorrow or the next day. Oh, that's Christmas Day. Oh, that's right. Hey, what are we sitting here chatting for? Come on, come on, let's move. <laughs> on the street at all. Oh, storm must have sent them all home, I guess. Oh, let's try that grocery store. They're sure to have a phone. Well, they can tell us where to find a garage, too. At least we can get the car off the road for the night. for that matter. Hello? Anybody here? 
Oh, well, we'll, we'll go someplace else. Sir. There's got to be a restaurant or a tavern in this town. Hey, come on. Oh, I, I know this isn't Runyonville. Oh, I hope not. Looks like a quaint little place, but awfully deserted. Boy, they must pull the sidewalks in at five in the afternoon. Oh, the, uh, the sky's clear. Oh, look at those stars. Wow, I haven't seen them that bright in a long time. There, there don't seem to be many stores. <laughs> Mostly houses. Well, we're not on the main drag. Maybe we better go ask directions at that house there. No sense wandering around a strange town. I, I guess we should. I'm sure they'll let us use their phone. I'll, I'll call Dad Collect. Hey, listen. Hear that? Singing. Of course, it's a carol concert. That's where everyone must be. Well, come on, let's see if we can find them. So many streets and nothing. Yeah, no one. Oh, hey, honey, you're shivering. No, I'm, I'm scared. Well, there's a hotel across the street. Let's go there and use the phone. There's got to be one there. This is a ghost town. Well, there's no use wandering about anymore. It's a ghost town in the middle of Ohio. I wonder. You know, you might be right. It could be one of those um, restorations. An antique village, and if it is one, then there's got to be somebody around. A caretaker or a watchman or someone. Oh, yeah, let's try the hotel. Well, I was wrong, I guess. The hotel is just as deserted as everything else. And still no phone. Oh, I wish I had that CB radio Paul offered me. I always thought they were a nuisance, but it sure would have gotten us out of this mess. Hey, come on, come on. Let's look around upstairs. Every room's empty. Not a stick of furniture anywhere. Yeah, that's about what I expected. What was that? Well, it, it sounded like something hitting the roof. Oh, Skip, let, let's go back to the car. I'm too frightened to stay here. This place is just too spooky. Yeah, come on, you don't believe in ghosts. It's not ghosts I'm afraid of. There's another one. Well, something sailed past the window and landed on the ground. I'm going down and take a look around. I'll come with you. I'm not staying in here alone. Can you see anything? Not, not yet. There's nothing out here, uh, except a couple of green logs. Over there, see them? Green logs? Yeah. A moss covered. Looks like they've been laying there for years. But, Skip, there's no snow on them. If they'd been laying there for years, they'd be covered with snow. You think that's what hit the hotel? Well, I mean, logs this big don't just fall out of the sky. Just... Take me back to the car. Now, now, honey, there's no sense getting panicky. We're alone in this town or amusement park or whatever it is. And at least there's shelter. We'll stay here for the night and we'll just try to get to civilization in the morning. You want to stay here? We might be murdered in our sleep. As if I could sleep. Well, dear heart, there's nothing else we can do. I mean, sleeping in the car is foolish when we're... Uh-oh. The lights. Every light went out. Well, that settles it. We're not going anywhere now. But the whole town's out. There's not a light anywhere. Yeah. It seems to be clouded over, too. See, the stars are gone. Yeah. Come on. Come on, let's go back inside. We'll be safe in there. <laughs> we'll curl up in the lobby furniture and try to sleep. Uh, I won't no. shut an eye, wondering who or what turned off those lights. To paraphrase a 
the popular joke. Where were Skip and Joan when the lights went out? Not only in the dark, but in a strange Midwestern village. And just two days before Christmas, a time when they should have been enjoying the warmth of a friendly fireside, the pleasure of holiday decorations, the music of a Christmas carol, things that most of us are enjoying these days. But for them, isolation in a cold and darkened hotel. We'll learn what this curious town holds in store for them when I return shortly with Act Two. Bartram faced the prospect of spending the night in a deserted hotel in a strange and darkened town. A town apparently without inhabitants. Could it be a restoration of some kind? A sort of Midwestern Williamsburg? Under normal circumstances, it might be a lovely place to spend the Christmas holiday. But Skip and Joan are anxious to get to her parents' home and friendly family warmth. They spent the night in the sparsely furnished lobby of the hotel. And now, it's morning. Skip. Skip. Huh? Wake up, honey. Oh. It's daylight. Oh. Oh, my aching back. Oh, that's the hardest couch in the world. Uh, I didn't sleep all night. Come come outside. I, I want to show you something. Oh, no. Can't you bring it in here? Oh, stop being silly. There are footprints in the snow, and they're not ours. Footprints? Yeah, look out the side window there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they go around the back of the hotel. Well, that means somebody's around here. Come on. Well, they're, they're small prints. It must be a child or a woman. Well, they lead toward that barn. It's funny, I, I didn't hear or see anyone. I was awake all night. Well, there aren't any prints leading away from the barn. So whoever made them is still in there. It's so quiet. Not a sign of life anywhere. Well, let's go in. It's not like a private house. Anybody here? Well, it's so dark. Dark and dingy, Skip. Skip, let's go back out. I don't like this. Well, somebody's got to be here. I mean, the footsteps stopped at the door. Then why won't they answer us? Hey, listen. Well, that was somebody's up in the loft. They're coming down those stairs. Who's down there? Oh, good, good morning, ma'am. Uh, we're looking for someone to help us. Mercy... Where did you come from? Well, we had an accident with our car last night. We skidded into an embankment. Oh, my word. We we found the whole town deserted, so we spent the night in the hotel. Oh, how curious. There aren't any beds in that hotel, you know. We slept, or rather stayed, in the lobby. I'm Skip Bartram, and this is my wife, Joan. We were wondering... Oh, please, to meet you. I'm Mrs. McKinney. Well, we were wondering if this is some sort of uh, a restoration. I mean, there were lights on last night. And we heard Christmas carols. Oh, yes. Isn't the music lovely? What do you mean by a restoration? This is Taylor Town. But there's no one living here. You're the only person we've seen since last night. Yes, they've all gone. Each season, a few more left. My husband went last year. I'm the last one here. You live here all alone? All alone in, in a deserted town? It's my home. Uh, well, uh, could we uh, use your phone, Mrs. McGinnis? Joan wants to call her dad to pick us up and... Well, I've got to get a tow truck for the car. Oh, mercy me. There's no garage or tow truck. Oh, but there's a pay phone at the railroad station. We never had phones in any of the houses. And just wait till I finish upstairs and I'll show you where it is. I don't know if it works, though. I think it's just there for effect. 
I wonder what she meant by that. Well, who knows? I, I just feel better now that we've met another human being. She seems friendly enough. But a little strange, don't you think? Well, naturally, <laughs> living alone in a dead town. A ghost town. I wonder how long she'll be. But we could find that railroad station ourselves. Oh, let her be hospitable. A few minutes won't matter. Uh, Mrs. McGinnis? Mrs. McGinnis, are you almost finished? That's strange. Well, I'll see. Has something happened to her? Mrs. McGinnis? Skip, what's the matter? Well, she's not here. The loft's absolutely empty. Well, there's no way she could have gotten out of that barn. Oh, the, there are no windows in that loft. Well, if she did, unless we just imagined we saw and talked with her. No, no, she was there all right. She, she just gave us the slip somehow. Oh, look, there's the railroad station. Oh, pray that that phone works. Well, I'm not counting on it, but, well, it's worth a try. But it looks like one of Bell's first pay phones. Uh, Skip, have you got a dime? Yeah, I think so. Uh, here you are. Well, here goes. Well, huh? so far, so good. Oh, I got a dial tone. Yeah, at least something works in this town. Well, it's only ten after nine. One of them's bound to be home. Ah, it's ringing. Yeah, they're probably looking out the windows, wondering where we are. Hello? Is somebody on this line? Oh, Dad! Oh, Dad, thank heaven I reached you. Who is this? It's Joan, Dad. Joan? I can hardly hear you. Speak up. Dad... It's Joan. We've had an accident with the car. You'll have to pick us up. Where are you? You'll have to talk louder. A place called Taylor Town. It's practically a ghost town. Do you know where it is? Taylor Town? Look, we'll wait for you in front of the hotel. How long will it take you? Uh, well, it's, uh, ten after nine now. About one hour. Oh, we'll be here. Oh, I can't wait to see you, Dad. Dad? Dad? Oh, the line's dead. What's the matter? You look concerned. But Dad sounded so funny. I, I expected more of a, a reaction. He was so matter-of-fact. He didn't ask for details or anything. Oh, I'm sure he figured he'd find out the details when he picks us up. Mm, yes, I suppose. You know, dear, I have this strange feeling I know this village. Well, not the village so much, but, but the houses. The houses look so familiar. Well, a lot of small Midwestern towns have that turn-of-the-century look. I guess so, we used to go shopping in, in Fairmont, and it was full of the same big houses we had in Runyonville. You know, with porches around the whole front and little filigrees under the eaves. <laughs> like that place on the corner. Exactly. And look who's on the porch. <gasps> Mrs. McKinnis. Hello there. Where? Where did you come from? I don't get many visitors anymore. We wondered where you went. Where I went? Why, I've been here all morning. Sweeping the snow, you know, got to get it off the porch before it freezes. Well, what brings you to Taylor Town? Skip, she doesn't remember us. Uh, uh, Mrs. McGinnis, we met and you. you know my name. Mercy, who are you? Mrs. McGinnis, we... We met you at the barn this morning, and you said... A barn, you say? Oh, there's a nice one behind the hotel. 
Won't you come in for some hot coffee? Takes the chill off. Yeah, thanks. We'd like that. Well, come along in, then. I'll heat up the pot. Yes, I don't know. Well, what harm can it do? Look, we, we've got at least an hour to wait for your dad. We might as well spend it in a cozy kitchen. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come out to the kitchen. Hot coffee in a minute with some fresh scones I made myself. She keeps a neat house. And so, you know, old-fashioned. It's lovely. Yeah, oh. a pretty start. <sighs> Come in and sit down at the kitchen table. I don't have much, as you can see, but there's always something to share. You're planning on moving here, you said. Uh, no, Mrs. McGinnis. Uh, we told you we had an accident with our car. Oh. That's too bad. But I just called my father. He's coming to pick us up. You you called your father? Yes, just now, on the phone at, at the railroad station. Oh, mercy, that is a miracle. I didn't know that phone ever worked. And we're happy to enjoy your hospitality while we're waiting. We still can't understand why there's no one else in town. You live here all alone? It's my home. Oh, it's not bad living alone. I get by. Yeah, we thought it was some sort of restoration. I don't know what a restoration is. A restoration is an old town or house that's been restored to look the way it did years ago. Oh, this town's looked like this from the beginning. Ever since it came from Scotland. The town came over from Scotland? It's an exact duplicate of Taylortown in Scotland. The streets and the houses and all the furnishings came from Scotland. Oh, mercy, don't ask me how long ago. Then you were born here. I guess so. You guess so? Well, I've never been anywhere else. Oh, you're not eating the scones. Uh, I guess we'd better get over to the hotel and wait for Dad. Thank you so much for your hospitality, Mrs. McGinnis. Oh, I'll come along. I'd like to see a modern automobile. I'll just get my shawl. It won't be a minute. She shouldn't be living alone like this. It's made her completely confused. Oh, I know. Well, there's nothing we can do, though. And she kept offering us scones. And the plate was empty. Well, she's living in the past. Well, I wish she'd hurry. I, I don't want to miss Dad. Well, we've got lots of time. If he said an hour, well, we've only been here a few minutes. Well, I, I wonder what's keeping Mrs. McGinnis. Look, why don't we just go on? She'll follow us. She knows where the hotel is. Well, Mrs. McGinnis? You about ready? Mrs. McGinnis? Oh, not again. Oh, talk about the Cheshire Cat. Come on. Let's get out of here. Do you want your eggs scrambled or fried this morning, Will? Well, fried is easier. Oh, I do hope we hear from the children soon. I'm getting awfully nervous. Oh, I thought they'd at least arrive last night. But not to call. It's not like Joan. Well, that just means there's nothing wrong, Harriet. If they'd had trouble, we'd have been the first to know. Something's not right. I just feel it. Well, it's ten after nine. If they're not here by noon, maybe I'll call the police. Oh, oh. I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Is it Joan? Well, there seems to be a voice, but I can't make it out. Joan? Oh, it's a bad connection. I don't know if it's Joan or not. Oh, dear. Hello? 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 Uh, it's no use. Whoever it was will have to call back. We'll just have to wait. Frightened. I wasn't before, but now, 
No, I really am. There's something evil here. I mean, no people except that crazy Mrs. McGinnis. But your dad's on the way, huh? I wonder. It's been two hours now. Well, maybe he had trouble. At least he knows where we are. Doesn't he? How do I know? All we do is, is ask each other silly questions. I'm cold and I'm tired and I'm hungry. Oh, Joan, Joan. We may just die here. Don't you realize that? We may just die here. Oh, stop it. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, hon. I had to stop you. I'll, I'll get control of myself. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, we'll just have to wait. waiting in Taylortown, expecting her father to pick them up any minute. But Joan's father, as we now know, didn't get the call. And he and his wife are waiting to hear from Joan. It looks as though Skip and Joan won't be with her folks for Christmas after all. Or at all, for that matter. We'll just have to wait to see how it turns out when I return shortly with Act Three. Now, it's not going to be a very Merry Christmas for Skip and Joan Bartram, apparently marooned in a strange little Ohio town with only one inhabitant. After encountering the elusive Mrs. McInnes for a second time, Skip and Joan have gone to the hotel to wait for Joan's father. It's a cold December afternoon, and it's been a long wait. What time is it? Uh, ten after two. I'm going to phone home again. Maybe there's a reason Dad was delayed. And after that, I'm going to call the state police. I, I should have thought of it before. We're in a real emergency here. They'll tow us out. Come on. But suppose Dad comes after we've gone. We'll ask Mrs. McGinnis to watch for him. Mrs. McGinnis? Mrs. Houdini, you mean. I wouldn't trust her to give Dad a message. Uh, well, we're getting out of here as fast as we can. Your father or the police... Whichever comes first. Okay. Okay, here, try your folks again. It's dead. There's no dial tone. Nothing makes sense in this place. Oh, well, it's no use. It's as hands dead as... up, hands up. Stay right where you are. She's got a gun. You... That you'd be taking off. M -m 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 Mrs. McGinnis, well, why the gun? How do you know my name? Uh, uh, a lucky guess. W why are you pointing that gun at us? I want you out of here now. I don't trust strangers. Mrs. McGinnis, you were so hospitable to us before. Why are you... Before? I've never seen you before in my life. Now get out of here. Start walking. W where to? To wherever you come from. I don't allow strangers here. This is a nightmare. You don't scare us. Because I know in a couple of minutes you're going to disappear. What are you talking about? You've been popping up and vanishing all morning. In a few minutes you'll just disappear. Poof. So we are waiting right here. Oh! Well, come on, Joan. She means it. But where can we go? Back to the car. She wouldn't really shoot us. She couldn't. Keep going. We're not taking chances with that crazy old woman. But we'll freeze out here. And Dad won't find You'll have to pass the car on the highway. <sighs> Nothing makes any sense here. Skip, look back. You were right. She's gone. Well, we'll be okay here. The motor works. I'll just turn on the heater. Come on, hop in. Oh, there's, there's more damage than I thought. The whole front end's caved in. What a Christmas this has turned out to be. Oh, honey, we'll get out of this. Yeah, let me get the heater going. We might as well get some holiday spirit, if the radio still works. Oh, I am 
so. Bush. Mm, well, you didn't sleep all night. And I didn't get much myself on that wooden couch. I hope Dad comes soon. Yeah. You know, we can't keep the motor running all day. Well, I hope Mrs. McInnes doesn't show up again. Oh, no, she wouldn't follow us out here. But lock the doors anyway. Hey, you all right in there? Hey, you too. Hmm. Huh? Well, who's that? What's the matter? Are you two okay? Oh, it, oh it's a state trooper. Oh, we, we fell asleep. Oh, oh. My leg. Oh, are we glad to see you. Anybody hurt? No. Oh, no, we we must have dozed off. Dozed off and ran off the road. The helicopter spotted your car and called us. Oh, thank the Lord for that. How'd you get on this road? It's officially closed. Well, there weren't any signs about that. It connected with Interstate 40 and we just stayed on it. Had the bad luck to skid into boulders. This extension isn't due to open until next summer. Where are you heading? Runyonville. My parents live there. We're going uh, home for the holidays. Uh, you wouldn't have gotten there on this route. It ends about 100 yards up ahead. I'll radio for a tow and get you folks to Runyonville. Uh, when did you go off the road? Last night. You've been here all night? Well, uh, no, we went into Taylortown. Taylortown? Yeah, right up the road. But it's a ghost town except for a crazy old woman who lives there. Uh, I better get you folks to the hospital first. Just a checkup. You know, possible concussion. Oh, no, 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 we're all right. My wife's ankle was twisted, but once we got out of the car, she was okay. We do not need a hospital. You say you spent the night in a place called Taylortown? Yes. There is no Taylortown around here. I've lived here all my life. And there just isn't any place called Taylortown. But right up the road. Look for yourself. We were there all night. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, maybe you'd better look. <gasps> oh. There's nothing there. No village at all. No, ma'am. The road ends at that vacant field. Not a town as far as you can see. How are they, Doctor? Well, no sign of concussion at all. No injuries except abrasions on the woman's ankle. Yeah, well, what about that story about spending the night in a village called Taylortown? Uh, hard to say. Huh, maybe they did. Uh, they must have imagined it. Yeah, they show no signs of exposure. They only think they were there through the night. They may have been on the road only a couple of hours. The helicopter spotted them two hours ago. They went to a village named Taylortown... They were hallucinating. Uh, hallucinations, quite common in extreme circumstances. Mirages in the desert. Man. Anxiety can produce them. Then you think they spent the night, like they said, in a village that isn't there? Well, they had an emotional experience. Physically, they're fine. I see no reason to keep them here. They're better off going home to the woman's parents. <laughs> A police car is driving up. Joe, mother, Oh, here, Are we glad to see you? Oh, mother. We were just about to send the police out looking for you when you called from the hospital. Oh, well, I'm going to send that state trooper a whopping Christmas gift. I got his name and badge number. Skiff, it's so good to see you oh, again. Same here. Thank heaven you're both okay. Come on in, everybody. No use standing here in the cold. What happened, Dad? We thought you were coming to pick us up in that place called Taylortown. 
Uh, that's what puzzles me. We never heard from you. The phone rang early this morning, but no one was there. Oh, I know I had a bad connection, but I was sure I heard you say you'd meet us. You seem to know where we were. You mentioned this Tabler town. There's no place like that around here. Where exactly were you? Oh, I've never heard of it either. But we were there. I know the trooper thought we were loony. Oh, I don't know what to say about all this. Why don't you both just relax? I've got a buffet all ready. We'll have cocktails and you can tell us all about it. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll get your suitcases up to the guest room. We had to leave all our gifts in the car, but they're towing it in tonight. So we'll have them in time for Christmas. No, they don't matter, dear. Having you here and safe is what's important. Now, you just relax and enjoy the tree while I get things ready. You must be famished. Oh, it's so good to be home again. And at Christmas time, everything's so pretty. And... Yeah. Ooh, that's some tree. I just love the decor. Skip. Look. What? Under the tree. Look, come closer. Oh. The little village set out under the tree. Cardboard houses. Look, look at the hotel. It's Taylor Town. Mother and Dad got this set when I was a child. I'd forgotten it. Every house, every street is just the way it was. The railroad station, the little store, and oh, Mrs. McGinnis's house. Uh, J- Joan, wait a minute. We weren't... We couldn't have been there. That's what the trooper said. What happened to us? Oh, hey, I'm getting the chills. Look at those pine needles from the tree. Those are the green logs that hit the roof. I wonder. What? Mrs. McInnes. Could she be... I... I think she disappeared for the last time. What should we tell Mother and Dad? I I don't know. I I think we've said enough. I don't know what happened to us last night, but... We better stop talking about it. I guess you're right. Uh, Here are the orders. You can pour the wine, Will. A holiday toast, everybody. (laughs) Oh, I see you're admiring the village under the tree. Oh, we haven't set it up for years. <laughs> we used to put it up regularly when Joan was a child. Lately, we've just had a table tree. Ah, but this year, with you both coming, we went all out. Big tree, everything. Yes, yes, and it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, the detail in those houses is exquisite, isn't it? Yes, yes, very, uh, very realistic. It was imported from Scotland. It's been in my family for years. Well, here's to a wonderful holiday visit. Merry Christmas, everyone. If there were an explanation for everything, where would the magic in life be? I think we'd all lose interest if everything were cut and dried, neatly packaged, just right. We need a bit of amazement now and then to soften the blow of reality. Skip and Joan left reality for a brief period, and it gave them something to remember all their lives. 